before we start, my name's Mark, and this is my beautiful wife, Arnie Brenda, over here. Do you want to give her a big clap, over? Hey? Give her a clap. Just one thing, Arnie Brenda won't be sharing today. It'll just be me. She's going to save her voice for later when you come on the camp. For those that aren't coming on the camp, I feel sorry for you. You'd be going to miss out. You should have been there. But anyway, that's your loss and mine because we didn't get to offer you what we have. But before we start, I just want to do an acknowledgement to country. Okay, we acknowledge the traditional owners past and present, the people that walk the land before us and the people that still walk the land today. Today we stand on Yugambeh land or Yugambeh Jabun. We respect and we honour them. Just going to give you a welcome in language. We say Jingiwala, Yugambeh Jabun. Jingiwala Balanjali, Nabraga Yambalaila Julung, Nabraga Yambalaila Jamun. Binangu Nani, Mibin, Buning, Wajum, Bugube Mamang. I just said welcome to Yugambeh land. I said, welcome to this place, this place where we stand. You think of it as, what's this, is this Merrimack? Is it Merrimack? Yeah, all right, and it's, it's All Saints, but before that it was country. You think of country and you think of Australia. For indigenous people, country is more than just Australia. People come from different parts of Australia and they come from the land and they come from country. Aunty Brenda comes from Wiradjuri country, which is Galagambun, Western New South Wales. She doesn't say she is a Galagan Bone woman, she says she is a Wiradjuri woman. I then went on to welcome you to who we are. We are Balanjali, which means mangrove tree in the local language. You all know the mangrove tree, eh? Yeah, also called the river tree, which grows on all our rivers, which unfortunately are our houses, and there is still some Balanjali left. Okay, but that has a connection with the land and with the sea. Okay, and that's what defines the saltwater people. People who live on the coastline, they are called saltwater people. Okay, what do you think the people out west are called? Freshwater people. Okay, Arnie Brenda's father is a saltwater man. He is from Virapai, which is uh, Foster Tunkari. I mentioned Galagambone, which is western New South Wales. So she is a freshwater woman. So you had a saltwater man marry a freshwater woman. I well, then went on to say, for those people that are coming, and I'm excited that you are, you are going to go Nubraga, you are going to come with us, and you are going to go Yumbalayla Dulum, you are going to go travelling in a kayak. Okay, but you are going to go in a kayak, it is a 2018 version. Okay, where did that come from? Who was the creator of the kayak? Indigenous people. If it wasn't for indigenous people, we wouldn't have the kayak we have today. But you just think, oh, it's just a kayak, it's just a canoe. But it's more than that. It's much more than that. If you learn history, and if you learn proper history, we go way back, don't we? We go way back to the beginning of time. If we go way back to the beginning of time, the Earth was one landmass. Whether you believe in creation or whether you believe in evolution, they still come up with the same thing. We had one landmass. And then something happened on this planet, and the masses moved, didn't they? How did those people get here? I'm asking you. Did they swim? They came in a canoe. So the canoe is the heart of our spiritual pathway. How we got here. You got here today in a car. How did your people, where did you come from? Where did indigenous people come from? They got, they got here in a canoe. And there's a story of the three brothers, brothers, way back in the beginning of time. So that canoe is a carrier of knowledge. So you are entering into a story, and you are part of that story. Okay? So you're not just going young Balayla Dulum, you are going to go travelling with the sea on a canoe, which is history. Okay? You are Australians. For years we've separated two cultures, black and white. We are now one, aren't we? We are all Australian. So your history is bigger than 250 years. I want you to think about that. You are a human being. You have life. You live here. You go to school. Do you ever think about the bigger picture? Okay, you are going to sit in a canoe, in a kayak. You are going to go on a journey with us. Some of you missed out. I feel sorry for you. Because you would have had a real on-country experience which would have changed your life 
forever. It will be something you would never forget. And every Australian <coughs> should share that experience. 60,000 years of history. We've been here for how long? We're going to celebrate what? How long have we all been here in this country? We're going to celebrate what? In a, a couple of years. 250 years of living in Australia. Well, people have been living here before that. And we need to acknowledge them. That history now becomes your history. So let's learn it. So we're going to take you by the hand. We're going to take you in the kayak. You're going to go Yumbalala, juggling with us. You're then, as I said, are going to go Yumbalala, juggling. You're going to go travelling with what? With your feet. You're going to go walking with us on country. We are on Yugambeh land. When we go over there, we are still on Yugambeh land. But we're on an island. Okay, and that island is South Stradbroke Island. And that is part of the beautiful Gold Coast that we live in. I then went on to say, which is really important, these are the two key words. Binangu, nangi, which means you need to be looking and listening. What happens if you don't look and listen at school? What happens for those people that keep on resubmitting the same thing but don't read the question and then answer it? They haven't paid much attention, have they? They're making life difficult for themselves. So even looking and listening, we're sharing about that. You're going to look, you're going to listen. We're taking you out on a journey. You're going out on country. If you don't look and listen, you're going to miss so much. Just like if you're in a classroom, if you're not paying attention, you're going to walk out the door and what have you learned? Not much at all. Okay, but I believe the best experience you can have is out of the classroom and actually have the experience. I then went on to say, if you do open your eyes and you do open your ears, you could see the Mibin. Does anyone know what Mibin is? Does anyone know the totem for this place? You don't? I'm surprised. The totem for this place, you all saw the Commonwealth Games? Yeah, it was here in your own backyard. When they had that opening <coughs> ceremony, what bird did they have? Yeah, they had Bigaloo, don't ask me why. <coughs> they had the wedge table with a wedge tail eagle, didn't they? But have a guess what? That's not even the totem for this place. They couldn't even find the right bird. The totem is Mibin, which is a white-bellied seagull. Okay, so when you come with us, you could see the seagull. Then I mentioned one more answer. So the seagull comes from where? Where does it fly? In the sky. I then mentioned pudding. Does anyone know what pudding is? It's got, it's got pills on it and it eats ants. What eats ants? What animal? The echidna. Okay. Very good. Okay. I then mentioned a very important animal. Okay. And the indigenous people call it the caretaker of the sea. Does anyone know what animal is the caretaker of the sea? Tell me who's supposed to be the caretaker of the land. Us. Okay, listen. So indigenous people have been the caretaker of the land for 60,000 years. Do you think we've done a very good job in 250 years? Did you know, I'm not painting a bad picture, I'm just telling you the truth and I'm being honest. Do you know we have the worst impact to country and people more than anywhere else in the world, yet in only 250 years. How sad is that? So you tell me, who is the future? You. That's why you need to look and listen, and it's so important more than ever before that we all need to look and listen to the first people of this country who do have the answer to our problem. They do have the solution. We just need to take the time to look and listen, which you're going to do when you come with us. I then, with the most important thing at the end, I then said, Google Bear Mama. I thank God. I thank Mama, God, the Creator Spirit, for the great opportunity we have to be here with you today. But before I go any further, so we did acknowledgement and I just did welcome. And you might say, how come this white fella, which is who I am, Okay, when we say white fella, black fella, we don't mean to discriminate. We're not trying to be racist. 
So I don't mean to offend by saying that. That's just how we talk. Okay, that's how we talk in community. That's how we talk amongst each other. You may find that offensive, I apologise, but that's just how we share. Okay? So what I'm going to do, I'll hand you over to Delma, and she's going to push that little button. But before she does, the reason why I'm showing you this, it goes for 2 minutes and 58 seconds. We had a author who actually, I'll talk about the, the history about how it happened after, but he actually wanted to do an experience, so we gave him that experience. And that is the wrong one. I think the other one. Yeah. Okay, so listen to this. The canoe is a bigger story than others. The canoes carry people into the story for thousands of years, for generations of generations. The canoe is a vessel to carry us into this story. Together with Bunjalan canoe maker Carl Slab, veteran paddler Mark Matthews, and the local indigenous communities, they set out to make traditional canoes. So guys, that was a documentary that we've just completed and that author has now written a book called The Saltwater Story and that's going to be on Netflix and it's also, I think, going to be used in every school or Catholic school at this stage in Queensland as a good resource of Indigenous culture. Now, how did he go about doing that? How it started for him, he is a very successful writer. He's lived on the Gold Coast for most of his life and he had a son. He's only got one child. And he was down with his son teaching him how to swim down at Burley Headland. You all know where that is, eh? We call that Jeroboam. Okay, he was down there. And while he was there, he was sitting with his little boy. He was only about five at the time. And he started to think about the past. And I hope, I hope you do that too. Often when I'm driving in the car, I always do it. I'm thinking of what did the land look like before we came? How much different was it? And I try to reflect on those images of what I think. It may have looked like. But I've been lucky. Elders have taken me by the hand. They've taken me in the car. They've taken me for walks. They've taken me on the sea. And they've shared with me what this place used to look like. But he was sitting there and he saw some people out surfing and he thought, well, back in the day there wouldn't have been anyone out there surfing. So what he did, he put up his hand 
And he actually <coughs> covered the people that were out there surfing so he couldn't see them. And then he started to think about the little black faces down on the beach and those white teeth and just think of those images. And he looked at his little son and he thought, I don't even know the story to that headland. I don't know what it's about. Here I am a writer, I live on the Gold Coast, and I don't know anything about that place. So, he thought, how do I go about that? So he went to museums, and he did a bit of research, and then he stumbled across an old trade route where for thousands of years, indigenous people from a little bit north from here have traded the Pipi, okay, with the Kondamooka people, a bunyanup, so the people from this place traded bunya nuts over to the Kondamooka people over at North Stradbroke Island and they did a certain canoe route. And he thought, what a story. What a story to document, what a story to write about and then learn about that headland. <coughs> so he could then share that, pass that knowledge down to his son. So he had to go through a process, the right <coughs> protocol. And he didn't know where to start but he went to those museums as I said. And fortunately for him, after about three years of searching, he nearly gave up because he, what he wanted to do, he wanted to find out how to build a paper bark canoe. Okay, we didn't use a paper bark canoe, but I'll share about that a little bit later. So, lucky enough, he had a friend who worked for the ABC. He got a little flyer in the post, and that was there was going to be a Bullandjali experience down on the Tweed River. So he thought he might invite him along. So he came on that experience, and we met him. And it just so happened, again, this is not coincidental, this is connection. This is how things work. The timing of it was perfect. Because Kyle, who you saw in that documentary, we've been talking about making a dugout, not a paper bar, for the last 20 years. That's all I've ever wanted to do. I'm sick of paddling a plastic kayak. I want to go back to nature. I want to paddle that original canoe. But it's never been the right time. And I just shared at the end of that two and a half hour experience that we gave that group of people, I just shared with them that a week before, I paddled a dugout canoe. So the timing was perfect. So after I spoke that out, without me realising, he got really excited. And after the trip, he came up to me and he said, I oh, you know that dugout canoe you paddled? Who actually made it? And I said, it's sitting down at Xavier Rogue's house right now. I said, I don't know who made that one. <coughs> but I know who, who can make it. And he said, I'm interested in making a paper bark canoe. And I said, yeah, that same fella can make that too. His name's Kyle Slab. He, he spoke on the trip. And he said, you think he'd be interested? <coughs> now for me, the reason why I'm sharing this with you is because this is part of what you're going to be doing today. This is part of your assessment, okay? The correct way to go about engaging with the Indigenous people. So the timing for one was right. We had paddled that canoe. Without him knowing, he stumbled across the tour. He'd come on that. He was fortunate that he did it with us and we just paddled the dugout. Okay? But for me, he's from, it's like two worlds colliding. I live in two worlds. I'm stuck in this system, okay, like we all are. But at the same time, when I go young Malayla, I then sort of go back in time. And sometimes my heart bleeds because. Sometimes it doesn't really work, does it? When you've got the old and the new. Okay, but um, so for me, for me to even ask Kyle that, this is a man of knowledge. He said 60,000 years of knowledge and that responsibility handed down to him. And only twice before in 20 years have I actually engaged people outside of the community to work with us. And on two of those occasions, it was unsuccessful. And then that responsibility reflects on me because I entered that group of people into the circle and it didn't work out. Okay, so for me to even ask Kyle, would he be interested in engaging with this author to make a canoe for us then to paddle, to then to document into a documentary and be published into a book, that's a pretty big responsibility. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. But one thing that interests me about this fellow, Ben, he wrote a book called, called Footnotes. He actually decided, he's a very good muser, and he decided that he wanted to produce an album, and he thought instead of doing it the normal way, he would just pick up his guitar, a jar of peanut butter, didn't even take a sleeping bag, and decided he would walk to Sydney, 
and he promoted his album that way. He walked for 55 days and wrote an amazing book. And a lot of people thought he was mad. I thought he was pretty smart. Because that's something that excited me. Because he walked on country for 55 days and lived off the land. So I thought, this man's got it. This man understands Yumbalala. He went travelling on country. So I introduced him to Kyle, who has that responsibility, and we had a meeting. And fortunately, the meeting went well. And that's how we ended up with that. So that was that process. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you another video because this is what you're going to be experiencing. And this is just a short three minute video which gives you a good understanding of the sort of stuff you're going to be doing with us. This is not the three day, the two day camp. This is a day activity that we do, but it just shows you what you will be doing. Good afternoon, everyone. 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 Good afternoon,
everything that has life. You have life aid. You have a spirit. Well, that same spirit is in every animal. And everything that is out there has a story for, for us. Everything is out there for us. And we share that story for you. And that story is something that you will carry for the rest of your life and you will use. Okay? You can, if you want to, bring your fishing rods. You can't bring your surfboards if you surf. Where we are staying, we are going from SeaWorld. We are paddling to Waybreak Island. You all know where Waybreak Island is. Some of you do, some of you don't, some of you don't care. Okay, well, Waybreak Island is a man-made island. When we get there, we share a story. We have a spear throwing competition. Yeah, you get to throw a spear at a target, but it's not alive. Okay, it's just a thing drawn in the sand. Those sexy looking dudes that were in that video prior, the saltwater story, for all you girls out there, they're coming on the camp. Okay, they're gonna be there, all those young fellas. For you boys, you have to put up with me. All right, but it's all good. Okay, after we have our spear throwing competition, you get to listen, that's good, you're getting excited. All right, once we have our spear throwing competition, we get divided into three groups. One's going to be nibbing, which is where? Of the what? Air, sky. The other one was bunning, which is from the land. The other one was what? Dolphin, wajan, which is from the sea. Which, which way is east? Very good. Which way is north? Shivers, but that's a bad start. Okay. Anyway. Some of you definitely need to come with us and we'll teach you how to go north, south, east and west. Alright, listen up. So you get divided into your three groups. We then paddle over to South Stravrake Island, which is the fourth largest sand island in the world. It's 22 kilometres long and two and a half kilometres at its widest point. You saw the Golden Wallaby, eh? Has anyone seen the Golden Wallaby before? You didn't even know it existed, did you? There you go. How good are you? We all live on the Gold Coast and you don't even know the Golden Wallaby is there. If we were smart for an opening ceremony, what a great thing that would have been. Instead of having Migaloo, have the Golden Wallaby show it to the world. It's only found here. It is found nowhere else in Australia and nowhere else in the world. It is one of the most endangered animals in the world. And it's right in our backyard and you didn't even know about it. Okay, we go and we track the animals. We bring the animals back to you. You learn that knowledge. We teach you how to find water. We teach you how to build a shelter. Then that night, you are staying in a beautiful cabin, which has a mattress. You're not sleeping on the floor. Okay, it's not that tough. You are then going to do a master chef. We're in your teams. After you have our spear throwing competition, the winner gets to choose whether they do entree, main or dessert. Your team gets $150 each. How mad is that? And we give it to you. You then go with my beautiful, sexy wife, Aunty Brenda, in the rescue boat. You go over to Woolworths, which has a jetty right next to it. How good is that? You get out of the boat and go to Woolworths. But no, but guess what? We don't have plastic bags anymore, but that's good, isn't it? So we've got to take our bags with us. So we're going to look after the environment. Then with your $150, you go in there and you get your food. You then cook for us. Five star, how good is that? We're going to eat like kings, aren't we? Five star food, but it's going to have an indigenous theme with an indigenous story that goes with it. Okay, even the colours of the food can represent, what are the colours of the indigenous flag? Red, yellow, black. So what could red be? Capstan. Yellow could be pineapple and black could be a burnt steak, couldn't it? <laughs> Alright? So it's going to be good. Then we get up the next day, have you guess what? On the first day, you've looked, you've listened, you've paid attention, you've learnt the knowledge. On the second day, you're going to apply the knowledge. So you guys in your team are going to find water yourselves. You're going to find all the bush tucker yourselves. You're going to build your shelter yourselves. Isn't that exciting? And it's going to be fun. Okay, now what's going to happen today and in September, I believe, you're going to be doing activities. Some of the activities you can do, you can respond to my beautiful wife's story. She was taken away as a young child. I won't go right into it. And you can respond to that. That can be one of your activities. In a skit, in a play, anything. Could be a poem. That could be what you present to us. What you learned from that story. What that did for you. How as a nation we can move forward and be better at what we do and how we behave. We're going to teach you how to track animals. So one of your activities could be, we're going to show you the technique to bring an animal back to you. So when you do that activity, and the boys will love that because you'll love to run around like idiots, eh? All right, you can actually show and demonstrate to us how to bring the wildlife back to us using the proper technique. It could be building a shelter out in the playground using the proper technique. 
There's so many different things. We're going to give you the tools to do that. You'll have those tools. You'll know how to do it if you pay attention. And that's what it is all about. I've got to cover so many things here, and I'm probably getting in trouble because I haven't. But there are male and female roles. Just like there are male toilets and female toilets, eh? Us blokes don't go in the female toilet, do we? And women don't go in the men's toilets. That's the same thing in the mob. There is men's business and there is women's business. Okay? Auntie Brenda does the weaving. I don't. But I help her get the fibre off the right tree. I know where to go. I collect it. She makes it. Thank God for that because I'm terrible with my little fat fingers. And she's got beautiful, delicate, dark fingers. All right? I'm not being as young at all. All right? Um, anything else? Okay, just one thing to say. When it comes to families, just quickly, I've got to be quick, we're running out of time here. One thing too, if you go up to someone, okay, if we're at it, if you meet someone for the first time, what do you do? You shake their hand and you say, what's your name, don't you? Normally, well, hopefully you do. You don't go, my name's Mark, your name's such and such. But often in our culture, what do we do? We say, what do you do? We put it into a class of, are you a teacher? Are you this? In indigenous culture, this is what we do. I walk up to Auntie Brenda and I say, where you're from, cuz? All right, where you're from. Now, where you're from means where she's from. Is she a verified woman? Is she, is she, is she from Kujingbara? And also, too, she doesn't say her name's Brenda. She says she's a Simon. Because for Indigenous people, they can put that back to place. If I hear someone say they're a slab, I know they're from Fingal. If I, someone says they're a Simon, I know they're from Tari. If someone says they're a Hammond, I know they're from Galar. That's the difference between, because country is so important to Indigenous people. There's a bit of a difference, isn't there, don't you think, between the two? Okay, I've been informed today you are planning the activities. So after this, you're going to plan your activity, which you're then going to demonstrate to us in September. So the reason why we're moving out onto the grass, we're going to be there to assist. Okay, we're going to be there to guide you and give you more information so you know what to plan. But also by doing the camp, it's going to give you the tools to do that. And just quickly too, in our system there is a hierarchical system, isn't there? You have a principal, he's the boss. Okay, in indigenous culture, everyone is equal. There is Gogon and there is Bana. There is the older brother, there is the younger brother. Okay, and everyone is equal and each one supports each other. No one is at the top. So me, it comes down to your knowledge. I am the paddler, so I have that knowledge. So I am Gogon. Okay, you are Bana because you don't have that knowledge. But when you come with me, you, you provide all the things that I need to help me as a paddler. Okay, does that sort of make sense? And in this country, who, so Gogon is the older brother and Barnam is the younger brother. Okay, who do you think is the older brother in this country? The indigenous people. We are Barnam. And this is where this country has gone wrong. We haven't supported our older brother, have we? As a country, if we support our older brother and our older brother is there to support us, straight away we have a solution in this country. In actual fact, when we came to this country, the, the indigenous person was not even classified as equal. They were not even like a younger brother. They were nothing. So that's what we need to do. We need to help and support our indigenous people. And they have all the answers. Their culture worked in harmony for 60,000 years. Okay? And now we're going a little bit off track, but we can bring it back. And we are starting to do that. And that's what's very exciting. And that's the exciting thing you have about coming on this journey. Because that is the start of doing that. Okay, I'm going to pick Mark's brain to your benefit. When we break up into the next section, the task that you have in your groups is to plan an activity that will give Indigenous content that could be utilised at something like NAIDOC Week, Harmony Week, etc. So, Mark has already explained that you know, a guy can't teach weaving, whereas a girl can. So you need to take that into consideration. Um, 
Mark, you might explain the difference between a welcome to country and tr acknowledgement of traditional owners. Well, I demonstrated that to you earlier, didn't I? Acknowledge when you, anyone can do acknowledgement to, to country. Not everyone can do welcome to country. Welcome to country is normally done by a traditional owner. The only reason why I've been welcome to country is because I've been given permission. Where we stand today, Kyle Slab, you saw up there, he's my cultural director. His grandmother's country is Bunjalung country, which is south of Tal Talabudra Creek. Yugan Bear country, which we stand today, is north of Talabudra Creek. This is his grandfather's country. So he gave me permission to do welcome to country. Okay, so welcome to country. The problem is with assimilation now, a lot of Indigenous people don't know where they're from. So often you get people who do welcome to country, they don't know where they're from, but they still have been given permission to do that. But that's where conflicts can arise because they may not have consulted with the traditional owners of that place and some people can still get their nose out of joint, but that's only because the system has been mucked up. But back in the day, the system worked. But assimilation has created all these problems, even fighting for country. Where do, where do those boundaries end? Okay, back in the day, this was Bundjalung, right through up to Brisbane, but now this is Yugambeh. Bundjalung has 12 tribes, Yugambeh has four tribes. Okay, so you, know, you could look at that as an option that you present an acknowledgement of traditional owners. Other activities may include, you may do a bush tucker or some form of bush tucker. Keep in mind, your group is presenting this to Mark and Brenda in September, so you don't want a large amount of props involved. You don't, well, you cannot go off-site. You may come up with with some great ideas, but it may not be practical um, to apply those. You could consider aspects of Indigenous art. It may be that you, know, you take on the painting of a boomerang that we all see in souvenir shops. It could be uh, one of the schools I was at last week. They were collecting beads, painting the beads, turning them into necklaces. There's those sort of possibilities. You may want to look at, um, I've already mentioned the weaving. There's a lot of Indigenous games you can research. Um, your group may present some form of an Indigenous game, depending on your ability. Some of you may have done bits and pieces through dance on Indigenous dance. Where do they stand and what other ideas are there? Is there any protocols involved with the dance? Or? Um, I wouldn't get into the dance. Mm -hmm. um, we'll leave the dance out. The only way I'd give permission to dance is that when you come on the camp, you could talk to the boys, those young fellas, yeah, those guides, and if you talk to them and they give permission for you to do a dance, and I would, I would actually do a dance that reflects the camp. Okay, because what dance is, remember, dance, like when I walk with Kyle, Kyle is a library. And there's only certain books that I get to read and he gets to share with me because stuff is sacred. Okay, and one thing about dance, the dance is actually, they didn't have a written language. And we share this on the camp. That dance is handing down knowledge to the young people. So they can then carry that knowledge. Okay, so dance won't be dance, it'll be a different form of dance. So basically, your whole activity in the next session is, as a group, you need to plan an activity you can present or a school could use as part of NAIDOC week. So it's open up to your group as to what topic you choose. Um, you know, there's those couple of suggestions there. Mark and Brenda and the trainers will walk around your group and work with you. Uh, where is the actual activity? Yeah. So the activity one, you need to name your activity. Two, does the activity support an authentic aspect of the local community area? What sort of things are we looking at there, Mark? To support the local community area. Yeah, so you know how I said one school was doing a kangaroo curry? and they were using local produce, that sort of thing. Uh, can you add to that? Or we're really looking for ideas that they can do as the activity, not on camp, but here in September.
Well, I think hunting for the boys is a technique solution. We're going to share all that out with you, building shelters. As I said to you before, you're going to learn that out there. That's easier than playground. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> James? Does the activity suit the community's needs and wishes? What would you be looking at there? Well, absolutely, because you're doing it. And you're actually participating in it. So, of course, that suits Indigenous people because you're actually doing it and they're happy that you're learning their culture mm -hmm. and we're sharing it with you. It's about you participating. As I said, it's your story as well now. Okay, question three. Does the activity have the potential for conflict? What could cause conflict in this situation? <laughs> That's if you upset me, don't I? <laughs> I don't see, look, the, the only conf, we, have, we don't have conflict because we have permission to do this today. Mm -hmm. And we and we know the protocols, and if there's any conflict, it's not you who gets in trouble, it's me who gets in trouble, because that's how protocol works, because I am responsible for you. And by the way, that's what Welcome to Country is. When they welcome you on country, that's why I really, Welcome to Country, it's good, but for Indigenous people, it actually means that while you're doing your thing, you're on their country, so if something happens to you, they are responsible for you. So it's deeper than how Western culture sees it. For Indigenous people, that's a massive responsibility. Okay. What protocol should they be aware of when delivering an activity? What protocols? I mean, I think that maybe comes down to the technology. Yeah, well, the most, the, the, the biggest thing is to look and listen and pay attention. For, our, for us, never stand behind us. Always stand in front of us. For Indigenous people, you never ever stand behind them when they're sharing. And always look and listen. When, when we talk, you don't. When we finish, you do. And even when I've learnt, I never ask questions. I wasn't allowed to. I just listened. And sometimes when they shared that knowledge, I didn't have the answer. But they would say to me, you, you'll know it. Do you know, I was told things 20 years ago that I only just found out the answer only a few weeks ago. Because it's that deep and it takes that long and you need to reach that level before you even learn the next bit. That's, that's it as far as the activity, the rest of your work in the group. So you've only bring a big clap of yarning up a storm, mate. <laughs> So I hope you have fun, because if you don't, we will. Alright then. Alright people, let's see. Hello, everyone. Thank you.